the Aqua Phi. Prologue. In the far and distant future, when we had colonized space, there were those of us who remained loyal to the Earth. But the Earth was ruined because of our lust for power. And so we built cities and took residence in them beneath the sea's roiling waters. Chapter 1 In the Beginning Hurry, Qualdor, said a tall man, dark in complexion and heroic in stature. This was Faltor, a distinctive-looking yet gentle man. His distinguished appearance spoke well of his attributes. He stood six feet five inches tall and was strapped with broad shoulders, a muscular chest, and powerful arms. For a man of his age, he carried a thin waistline. His physical characteristics clearly depicted his belief in exercising the body. Every other day, he and his wife Una made it a routine to work out at the fitness center whether they were tired or not. Together, Faltor and his wife were living advertisements for the value of physical exercise. They displayed grace combined with athleticism in their every movement. Their physical perfection mimicked the pictures modeling agencies used to fill the pages of popular magazines. But Faltor's physical attributes were not what attracted people to him. When looking into his azel eyes, others saw the vast intelligence he possessed. The same intelligence they experienced repeatedly in the choices he made as a member of the Group of Five, the decision-making group for his civilization. When observing the white hair that ran along his temples, anyone would reason that this must be a wise man. This was not faulty reasoning either. On countless occasions, his wisdom guided this civilization through troubled times, and this community came to greatly value Faltor's counsel. In the service that he rendered daily to his people, Faltor dispensed wisdom and love with a word here or a gesture of soft touch. Many experienced the warmth of this stout man's hands. They knew that he was a man not in search of glory, but rather in giving love, compassion, and kindness. You're about to be married today, young man, and yet you keep looking at the waters, announced Faltor. The waters are green and peaceful today. Look at the sea creatures as they swim about. It is as if they knew of my wedding. The sphere, Father, shines in its brilliance. It is a day made for Sunny and me for our wedding. Let us summon each of the inhabitants to have them attend the ceremony at the globe, sang out Qualdor. Feltor's son was a solid and well-built young man, created much in his father's image. Genetics accounted for Qualdor's dark complexion and wavy flowing hair. It was also visible that he espoused his parents' belief in exercising the body and mind. They inculcated into him the belief that a body that is vibrant and alive should contain a mind that is equally alive and vibrant. Standing up, Aldor could look into his father's eyes, despite being a forehead shorter. Although Faltor was six feet five inches tall, Una was only five feet eight inches in height. Qualdor shorter than his father, but with the same broad shoulders, deep chest, and defined arm muscles. Like his father, this civilization esteemed Qualdor not because of his physical perfection, but for the qualities that he possessed. The same kindness and love that his father possessed was also felt by others in Qualdor's presence. Lacking, however, was his father's wisdom. This was the one quality that only time and experience would cultivate. 
It could not come any other way. Yet the wisdom he lacked in youth was substituted with a constant curiosity and quest for adventure. Feltor put an arm around his son's shoulders, and they stood quietly for a moment, looking through the clear, structurally sound glass. They stared at the marine life that swam all around them. For centuries, their civilization lived under the sea, yet every day it presented new sights to contemplate. Feltor looked at the man beside him and reminisced about the time when this man was a boy. He remembered Qualdor running across his very same hallway, racing the fish on the other side. When Qualdor ran in a westerly direction, the fish sped westerly along with him. When he turned and ran easterly, they would also turn and speed along eastward. This was odd in Faltor's mind, because although the powerful glass was clear and one could see all life from the inside of it, from the outside, it was impossible to see inside the vessel. Perhaps the marine life could sense his son's quest for adventure through the glass and so were drawn to play with him. He stopped, pursuing the thought, and looked at his son as if to say, You're getting married today, young man, and we have a lot of work to do. Walter looked into his father's eyes and nodded in agreement to assure Faltor that he understood those silent words. The two men parted ways and headed towards their units in order to prepare themselves for the celebration soon to be held at the globe. The globe was a centralized life-sustaining sphere in this city comprised of intricate glass hallways built to withstand a tremendous pressure below the sea. The glass was strong against the high-speed underwater currents, turbulence, and waves. Even the occasional migrating mammal tested its several tons of weight on the glass to rest before continuing on its journey. Marine life circled around each glass hallway, and the beauty of the sea could be witnessed by those living inside of the glass, for their privacy and safety. The globe itself contained a technology hub, several recreation centers, entertainment and reception halls, as well as an exercise center where Faltor and Una could be found every other day. It contained all things essential to satisfy the needs and wants of each citizen. Every type of occupation imaginable took place in the globe. There were professions ranging from teachers and technicians to doctors and engineers. There was never any shortage of work or need to reduce a workforce. Everyone of working age performed their trade with exuberance. They were proud of their work because everyone did so to enhance the quality of their civilization as a whole. Every job was done with care and precision because the work they accomplished benefited everyone. There could never be a recession or an economic downturn since no one ever received a salary for their work. Money was not known to this civilization. Work was performed based on elevating oneself and one's society. Each inhabitant lived in a spacious oval compartment a unit for a family equaled 6,000 square feet of living area, while a single unit equaled 4,000 square feet. Every unit contained enough space for a family regardless of their size and allowed for the most modern conveniences, while furniture and decor reflected individual taste. In particular, the globe housed the Aquafi, a self-contained life-sustaining vessel, able to support this entire civilization of 500 for an extended time should the globe be destroyed. The Aquafi was a smaller version of the submerged city. It was a unit that measured 15 feet high and was the length and width of a football field. 